pastor here today. I hope that your summers are going so well uh, as we're getting into actually the middle of June. This month is already passing by so fast. And with that, we have Father's Day coming up here in the next couple weeks. So we just want to let you know that we have a lot of exciting plans uh, for Father's Day to celebrate all of the men in our world here. So don't miss the opportunity to come join us here in service live as we celebrate all the men We've got our Father's Day raffle. We're going to be drawing names that day. And even if you haven't registered for the Father's Day raffle, you can still do that the day of Father's Day when we pull names. And then we will let people know later in the week uh, who won. Uh, because we have to, you know, with all of our services, we have to pull then the names from those names that actually got pulled during the services. It's a whole thing. But anyways, we would love to invite you to Father's Day uh, for you to come join us. And we also have some giveaways that we're going to be doing that day too as well for the men. Uh, that's about all I have today for announcements because we just want to celebrate our dads so well. And so we don't want you to miss that we're going to be doing that. But I do want to celebrate that uh, Lauren and Andy Haig are doing so well in Greenville, South Carolina. There are church planners that just left a couple months ago. They have now been officially in Greenville, Greenville for a month living in their community, meeting new people um, and getting settled and just exploring uh, Simpsonville and Greenville and all the things that God has for them. They have some amazing stories so far of how God is working through what they're doing already there. 
And so if you missed uh, Lauren's update, which we posted on Facebook this last week, if you missed that, you can go back and find it on our Facebook page and you can hear about all the things that God is doing. And so with that, that is what our offering uh, thing is today. We just want to say thank you so much for continuing to give to the mission and vision here in Bloomington Normal. Because of you, the Hegs are on the ground in South Carolina. They're starting to do amazing things. They're starting to make amazing relationships with their neighbors, uh, even just a month in. And they're just so excited to see what God's going to do. And they feel so blessed uh, by the people that support them from here and support them from far away. And so again, we just want to say thank you. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pray and uh, then I'll explain to you how to give. Jesus, we thank you so much for today. We thank you so much for Lauren and Andy. And we just pray a blessing over their ministry in Greenville and in Simpsonville. And we just pray for more Holy Spirit encounters for them as they just minister to those around them, as they get into relationships with people, as they sit down at the table. God, that's their name of their church. And we know that that is Holy Spirit given to them that they sit at the table with people and they can just commune with them and tell people all about you. So God, we just thank you for Andy and Lauren, and we just pray a blessing over their family. In Jesus' name, amen. You can go to vineyardbloomington.com and click the, the Give button. If you want to give to Lauren and Andy, if you want to give out to our Sent Out initiative, you can just click on the Sent Out on the drop-down mission, uh, on the drop-down menu, I'm sorry, um, or you can just do your regular tithes and offerings. But again, thank you so much for supporting our church here. Because of you, we're getting to engage our cities here and also in South Carolina. All right. So I really hope that you guys have enjoyed the last couple weeks of this Unity series. It has been so powerful. And last week on Pentecost Sunday, we had a huge outbreaking of the Holy Spirit, which was awesome to experience. And so we want to welcome Adam back to the stage this week as he continues week four of our Unity series. I am betting that many of you out there in the room today, those of you watching online, did not know that I played the guitar because I uh, don't lead worship very often in our public services. But I've been playing the guitars for years. And when you first start playing the guitars, uh, you, you get interesting uh, things going on with your fingers. Your, your fingers begin to get little indents in them. I was just playing a little bit ago before our services started. You get little indents in them. Uh, and eventually uh, they begin to almost scar and, and those kinds of things. But you have to develop calluses in order to actually play the guitar well and not hurt your fingers in the process of, of pushing down those wires with your fingers. When you think about it, most of us try to avoid you know, putting our fingers against wires, but when you're playing the guitar, it's part of what you do. And you have to develop calluses in order to be able to play a little bit better. Now, those of us who maybe don't play the guitar, maybe you walk barefoot in the summer, or maybe you lift weights, you know uh, the benefit of calluses when uh, you're doing both of those things. Uh, walking barefoot uh, on a stony path when you've got some calluses, it's not as, not as hard on your feet. Uh, those of you that lift weights, you know you develop some calluses on uh, the pads of your hands uh, and so that you don't cut up your hands as much. Sometimes calluses can be very helpful, right, when you're playing the guitar, when you're lifting weights, but um, after I've been playing the guitar for a few years, uh, I ran into a, a man at my first church who was an extremely good guitar player. He practiced for hours upon hours a day. It was like, you know, we, we watch Netflix or have, you know, watch movies. We hang out with our, our kids or our grandkids, right? This guy, like in his free time, he wasn't gardening. He was playing the guitar. He just played all the time. And he was really, really good. I mean, it felt like you gave him any piece of music at any point in time and he could play it. And not just play it, but play it with excellence. Play it well all the time. Practicing, uh, I think he said an average day was about four hours worth of guitar practice a day. He practiced all the time. And so I was always amazed and learning from him and growing from him on how to play the guitar better. And one day I was hanging out with him uh, before he was getting ready to lead worship and he was taking a nail file and was filing the end of his fingertips on his left hand. And I was like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I'm filing down the calluses. I'm like, oh, I just thought like when I played guitar, like I always wanted to like get better calluses so that my fingers don't hurt as much after I've been playing. He goes, no, 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 no. I've got to file down the calluses because of this truth. 
if I can't feel the strings, I can't feel the music. I need to feel the strings in order to feel the music. He needed to get rid of the calluses to feel the music. Sometimes in our relationships, we get calluses, don't we? Sometimes in our relationships, we get calluses on our heart, we get calluses in our lives and our emotions. Let me tell you a little bit about relationships before I met my wife, Corey. Before I, I met Corey and, and we developed the, the good relationship that we have now 20 plus years later, um, I had a pretty callous heart, a pretty callous heart towards towards relationships. I, I, some would call me very cynical. Me and Jerry Seinfeld were best friends in the terms of being cynical about every aspect of life. Uh, I didn't really trust anyone with my emotions. Didn't really trust anyone with my relationships at all. In fact, I would say I wouldn't let anyone close to me. I wouldn't let anybody into the deep inner workings of my heart. Anybody ever felt that in your own life where you're just like, I don't want to get anybody later. Past, past conveying, past, uh, excuse me, past experiences had, had convinced me, right? Had past experiences had convinced me that the best way to do relationships was to keep my calluses on my heart. To keep my calluses on my heart so that no one got too close, so that no one could hurt me. Now, when I met Jesus in 1994, a lot of things began to change. A lot of things began to change in my own life. Um, and God began to convince me that um, a hard heart is not the best thing for a follower of Jesus. That a hard heart is not the best thing for anyone on the planet. He began to, to soften me and convince me that, you know what, it is a good idea, Adam, for you to begin to let people into your world, to your life. Because he's like, you know, I'm always loving you, Adam. I'm, I'm always patient in my love, always kind in my love. I'm always gentle in my love. I'm always forgiving in my love. I keep no record of wrongs with you, Adam. Remember the love I've described to you in 1 Corinthians 13 that was part of my, my, my coming to Jesus story. And he's like, remember that I am always soft-hearted towards you. So I want you to learn how to be soft-hearted in your relationships, to remove those calluses. Now, I agree with Jesus. I agree with Jesus that the childlikeness was so much better than a hard heart, so much better than a lot of cows. And I, I began to grow and change and, and really mature in my faith, mature in who I was in Jesus. And, and as I began to do those things, I began to get closer and closer to him and closer and closer to the, the childlike heart he wanted for me. But I didn't want to go there with actual love. I didn't want to go there with an actual relationship with somebody else. I still wanted to, to push people to the side because it's easier to push people away than to let somebody love you. It's easier to push somebody out instead of letting them in. And I had to let Corey love me. I had to let her love me. I had to choose to let her be a part of my life, to file off the calluses that were on my heart. See, she was in relentless pursuit of me, she'll say. She wanted to be in love with me. And I had to let her love me. I needed to feel the strings in order to feel the music with her. You see, I was never going to experience love if my heart stayed hard as a young man. I was never going to experience a real relationship if my life stayed calloused towards other people. See, we have to choose love, friends. We have to reject our calluses. We have to choose love and we have to reject the calluses that we've placed upon our hearts. We have to realize that God is in relentless pursuit of each and every one of us. That God is in relentless pursuit of our hearts and wants us to take off the calluses, to file down the calluses so we can feel the music of his love in our lives. Now, you may be asking yourself, what does this have to do with unity, the series that we're in the middle of? Why is this conversation so important when it comes to unity? If you remember in week one, we decided that we were going to take ourselves out of the center of our lives and place the Holy Spirit in the center of our lives. And let our life revolve around him instead of saying everybody else revolve around us. And that creates true unity in the body. Then we said there are some things that Jesus prayed over us to be one in, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. And then we said... God gave leaders and giftings to the church so we could all function the way he wanted us to function in the body of Christ. And he gave us these roles as leaders in the church to equip the church, to build up the church so that the church could become the fullness of who it was meant to be. 
Today we want to explore this. We want to help us realize that our identity in Jesus Christ is a big part of what brings unity in the body of Christ. See, if you live in your old self, your old way of life, your old way of thinking, your old calluses, then you're actually going to bring disunity to the family of God. Hear me on this. If you live in your old life, your old self, you're going to bring disunity to the family of God, friends. But if you begin to walk in your new purpose, your new destiny, your new identity, your new self, that's actually going to help bring unity to the body of Christ. So we've been in Ephesians chapter 4. And so um, open up your Bibles or your Bible app. If you're watching at home online, we encourage you to grab that Bible off the shelf. Maybe dust it off if you need to or, or, or flip over uh, to another page on your phone or on your laptop um, and, and pull out Ephesians chapter 4. See, Paul is trying to make a direct connection here. A direct connection between our thoughts and our actions and the effect they have on bringing either unity or disunity to the body of Christ. That our thoughts and our actions have a direct connection on are we bringing unity? Are we a person of unity, a person of helping gather the people of God together? Or are we a person who's pushing aside unity and saying, I'm going to create disunity by the way we think and the way we act? Here's what he says in Ephesians chapter 4. Now this I say and testify in the Lord. You must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They're darkened in their understanding. They're alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their hearts. You know that they've become callous friends and they've given themselves over to sensuality and every greedy practice and every kind of impurity. But that's not the way you learned about Jesus. What you learned about Christ. See, assuming that you've heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, and what you're taught in Jesus is this, to put off your old self, your old way of life, your old way of thinking, your old, your old actions, just put those things on the shelf, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt in its deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, in your thought processes, put in a new thought process and put on a new self that's created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and in true holiness. What's Paul saying here? If you live in your old thought processes, your old way of life and your old self, disunity is going to come. But if you learn to live in your new self and your new identity and your new destiny and your new purposes in Christ, that's going to help bring unity to the family of God, to the body of God, to our communities and to our cities. In fact, look at how Paul has not let this idea of our identity, our destiny, our purpose die. We spent a whole month if you remember in Colossians, and here it is coming up in Ephesians again, every single church that Paul writes to, he comes coming back to this point that, friends, your identity in Jesus Christ, your new person in Jesus Christ, your new reality in Jesus Christ is the most important thing for us to center in on as followers of Jesus Christ. It will change the way that you think and the way that you act if you can grasp this thing. So he's always coming back to it no matter what church he's, he's writing to. And here he is in the middle of a discussion on unity saying, don't forget about how important this is. Don't forget how important it is to live in your new self. So it, it's good for us to understand what does it look like for you and I to walk in our old selves? What does it look like for you and I to walk in ways that we used to walk, to think in ways that we used to think that could actually cause disunity in the body of Christ? Well, the first thing he says is, Living with a hard heart is what's going to bring disunity. If you've got a hardened heart towards other people, it's going to bring disunity. He describes a hard heart in three distinct ways in this, in this passage. He says, there's futility in the thinking that causes a hardened heart. There's darkened understanding that causes a hard heart. And there's ignorance that causes a hard heart. And what he's saying is, don't step back into that stuff. Don't step back into your pre-Jesus thought life and cause disunity by walking in that darkened understanding, in that ignorance, in that futility of thinking. So what does he mean by this futility of thinking? Well, let's look at it for a second. First, we need to understand what the Gentile like label would mean for him. He would say, okay, you are a non-Jewish person. You are a person who doesn't have a foundation in God. You know, the Jews were the only people group that had a foundation in the moral code and ethics of the world that, that we know now, but they would have been the only ones that had the moral code and ethics like baseline, the Ten Commandments, you know, don't kill people, don't murder. So the Jewish people were the only people that had this kind of basic understanding. So he said, don't jump back into a Gentile way of thinking that has nothing to do with a basic knowledge of who God is. They don't have a history or a practice or anything. The Gentile people don't. He's saying, 
That's futile thinking, is to not have a baseline flawed understand, don't have a flawed understanding uh, of, your, of where you're supposed to begin from. Begin from a, a, a realization that you actually have a knowledge of God. You have a knowledge of Father God. You have a knowledge of his love. So make sure you're starting from that place and not from a place that the Gentiles would have started. Well, what does he mean by darkened understanding? Without the light and the revelation of Jesus, your grasping of spiritual ideas starts from a dark place. If you're not starting from a, a place of revelation of how good God is, how good Jesus is, how good his, his sacrifice on the cross was, how good all those things were, if you don't start from that place, you start from a place away from that, your understanding is going to be so corrupted when you come to trying to figure out unity, it's going to be messed up. And it concludes this way. If your thought pattern is flawed, if your understanding of God is flawed, then your ignorant in the ways of God will lead you hard towards him, Right? If you don't have a good understanding of who God is and his love, if you don't have a good understanding uh, of, of a, a thought process that involves who Jesus is and his story, then you're going to come at God from a hard place. You're going to be like, I reject your ideas. I reject your thoughts, God, because I don't know you. I don't know who you are. Don't step back into the thought life that you had before you knew Jesus. Let me try and illustrate it this way. Have you ever had a family member who didn't understand your faith? Have you ever had a coworker or a classmate or a close friend that when you started to talk about church just pushed you away? Say, I don't want to talk about that kind of stuff. I, I don't really care about what you're going through, what your experiences have been. I, you know, when you talk about God, I, I'm not interested in that. Or they might even reject your friendship or not want to hang out with you as much or maybe not do as many family gatherings with you because you've gone down this road of, I, I care about church, I care about family, I care about what God's doing in my life, I care about what God's doing in my city, I care about my church. And all of a sudden, your, your close family members and friends who don't know God, who have a, 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 an ignorant starting place, right? Um, begin to go, I just don't want your relationship anymore. Yeah. It's actually not their fault, actually. It's not their fault. Um, their hard heart is, is not because of you or what you're saying. Their hard heart is towards God because they don't have an understanding of how much he loves them and how much he cares about them. So your unity gets broken, not because you've done something wrong, but because the worldview of the person who doesn't believe in God is just flawed. It's just flawed in its understanding of God. And so there's a brokenness in relationship that takes place between you and them. And so there's disunity because they don't have faith. Now, I would encourage you, don't ever break off relationship when this happens. Your job is to press in and to reveal the Father's heart to them, to show them what love looks like, to show them who Jesus is. And yet... Sometimes what happens is we're like, oh, I still want that relationship so bad that we begin to walk back into our old way of thinking. See, what we don't want to have happen is us to be silly enough to go back into our old life, our old thought processes, our old way of thinking so much that we become apathetic towards God in our own lives. What's apathy? Apathy, right, is kind of disillusionment, lack of enthusiasm, lack of interest, in, interest like getting detached from who God is, getting detached from anything, right, could be apathy. And so what we don't want to do is move from a place where we have a hard heart towards God into apathy. That's the worst thing that can happen. It can bring us to a place of we will cause even more disunity in the body of Christ. See, the next thing that Paul brings up is apathy. Apathy is the thing that's going to cause disunity in you. It starts with a hard heart, and sometimes a hard heart can move you into an apathetic lifestyle. He says, if you continue to go back into the thought processes that you had before you experienced the Father's love, you'll eventually become apathetic towards everything. And what I want you to understand is that apathy is very, very dangerous in the kingdom. See, apathy creates a family that doesn't care about the Spirit's work and the Spirit being in the center. Apathy creates a family that doesn't want to advance God's kingdom into every corner and every part of its city. Apathy creates a family that doesn't want to, um, uh, to, uh, to love people towards a relationship with Jesus. In fact, apathy tends to advance the enemy's work and not the Father's work in our own hearts, and our own lives, and our own expressions and, Ill and situations. See, when you're apathetic, what happens? You can't feel the strings. You can't feel the strings. You can't feel the music, the love of who God is for us and to us and through us. Um, and when we get apathetic, it actually leads us into places of sin, Paul says. See, callousness, it, it, when we get a hard heart and then we begin to get apathetic, 
Um, that's when we begin to walk in things that we never are were intended to walk in, and we tend to walk in things that we would never want to walk in as followers of Jesus. See, your callousness is what brings sensuality. Your callousness is what leads to greed. Your callousness is what grows the impurities in our lives. It's not actually us choosing those things. It's us getting apathetic and getting calloused hearts that actually leads us into places that are far from God. Let me try and illustrate this a little bit. How many of you know someone, those of you watch online, how many of you know someone who used to go to church? How many of you know somebody that used to go to church? It used to be a part uh, of a regular gathering of the saints and the believers for worship. They used to go. Then something happened. Something happened in their church that disappointed them. Something happened with their pastor or their small group leader that disappointed them. Some relationship got broken. Some disunity formed in some way, shape, or form. And they rejected God's bride. They rejected the family of God. They rejected coming and gathering with other saints and believers to worship. They rejected it. And what happens is they became apathetic towards, well, towards one person, maybe. But what happens is they become apathetic towards the bride of Christ. They become apathetic towards the bride of Christ. They claim, you know, I still love Jesus, but I don't love the church. Which, by the way, is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. And I'm sorry if you don't like the use of the word stupid, but just hear me on this. You cannot love me and hate my wife. You cannot love Corey and hate me. It doesn't work that way. We are one flesh. We are united together. And the same is true with Jesus and the church. You cannot love Jesus and reject the church, friends. In my experience, what happens is when somebody has a bad relational issue or, or something happened in the community and they reject the church, but I still love Jesus, is what happens is they begin to get really, really apathetic and callous and hard towards the church. And what I see them doing is they suddenly begin to tolerate things they would never tolerate before when they were part of the family of God. They suddenly begin to believe things they never believed before they were part of the family of God. They suddenly begin to post things on social media that have nothing to do with actually Jesus and the advancement of his kingdom. In fact, you might even see them do, go as far as to give hate speech towards God's bride, towards the church. And let me tell you this, this didn't happen overnight for them. It never happens overnight for somebody. It didn't happen because they made one choice. It happened because many choices happened over and over and over again until they had a calloused heart and became apathetic towards what God was doing in their cities. They can no longer feel the strings. They can't feel the music of God's love due to the callousness that's on their hearts. Does this make sense? See, with a hard heart, we start thinking the wrong way. With calluses, we begin to get apathetic. And we start thinking about, how do I just go back to my old self, my old way of life before Jesus? See, living with an old life mentality, living in your old life, will bring disunity as well. See, when you begin to live in your old life, you begin to think differently, don't you? We begin to find ourselves wanting to follow our desires and not the Father's desires for our life, for our hearts, for our cities, for our church. We begin to find ourselves wrapped up in our old way of thinking, the way we thought before we ever met Jesus or knew Jesus or had an experience with Father God. We begin to, well, we begin to go back into a thought pattern, into a lifestyle that has nothing to do with what God wants for you and for me. See, we need a way when we get, see ourselves going down that path to shake off our apathy. We need a way to soften our hearts again to Father God. We need a way to say, okay, I'm not going to step back into my old life, my old way of thinking, my old patterns, my old actions. I'm going to begin to step into my new life, my new thought process, my new identity, my new destiny, my new purpose in Jesus Christ. And my belief is that communion is that bridge. If you're a believer, I believe that the taking of the juice and taking of the cracker, the remembrance of the cross of Jesus Christ becomes the bridge to shake off your hard heart to remove and file down those calluses, to put aside your old self and walk into your new self. I believe the communion is this bridge. I think for anyone struggling with the futility of their thinking, or anyone that's feeling alienated from God's love, for anyone struggling with a hard heart, for anyone questioning, should I return to my former way of life? I believe that the cross of Jesus Christ, the remembrance of his sacrifice is the only way to shake those things off. It's the only way to file off your calluses. It's the only way to feel the music again. Now, if you've never said yes to Jesus, 
If you've never said yes to Jesus, if you're not even a believer in this moment, whether you're watching online, you're sitting here in this room and you've never said yes to Jesus, I believe the bridge for you is a new heart. I believe the bridge for you is for you to receive the heart that God promised to everyone who believes. He says this in Ezekiel 36. I will give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit within you. I will remove your old heart of stone and I will give you now a new heart of flesh. I believe that Father God, when we say yes to him, gives us a new heart. Father God gives us the new ability to recognize and to see him. The only solution for both of us, whether you're a believer now who feels apathetic and calloused, or whether you are somebody who was a non-believer and hasn't stepped into this, the only solution for both is the gospel, is the truth of the cross, the truth of the sacrifice of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is the truth of the fact that God loved us so much, he sent his only son to die for us on the cross, to conquer sin and death, to resurrect both for us and as us to give us new life in him. And the only solution is a grace to grasp how good the resurrection of Jesus Christ is for us, how it transforms all of history from that moment forward. The only solution is the cross. Communion is the bridge for us to remember if we are believers, getting a new heart in Jesus Christ is the bridge for you if you've never said yes to Jesus. So let's not just sit here and go, okay, Paul's passage is all about all these, these negative things. If you have negative thought processes, you're returning to your old life, you're becoming apathetic and calloused, you're going to cause disunity. Well, let's read this, this passage of scripture again, um, but not through the lens of, oh gosh, here's all the stuff that could be going wrong. Let's look at it with a renewed hope. I want to look at it with a renewed hope that there's a possibility for actually actually shift and change things as we refocus. Here we go. Ephesians 4 again. Now, this I say, and I testify in the Lord. Get this. He's like, you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of minds. Okay, you have the power to rise above a negative, non-God-fearing, non-God-honoring, non-God-loving way of thinking. You can do it, Paul's saying. You know what? Those that, that walk that way, they're darkened in their understanding. You do not, you are children of light, friends. They're alienated from the life of God. They just are ignorant because they have a hard heart. They've become callous and given themselves over to all kinds of stuff, sensuality, greed, impurity, all the things. But that's not what you've learned. You've learned something different. You've learned a new way, friends. Assuming you've heard about him, you were taught about him. There is truth in Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. So the truth in Jesus Christ is that we can put off our old self, which belongs to your former life. And it was corrupt back then with deceitful desires. But you can be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And you can put on a new self created in true righteousness, created in the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. What's Paul saying here? He's saying you can walk differently because of the gospel story, because of the cross, because of what we remember in communion. You can walk differently because you have a new heart. You can walk in the light of God. Not be darkened in your understanding. For walking in the light has the power to change everything and everyone. Living in light is going to bring unity to the body of Christ. Bring unity to the family and friends who have said yes to Jesus. Unit, or living in the light is going to bring power to all the problems that you, you could have. Living in the light is going to bring power to that. So what's he saying here? He's saying, okay, get this. You can walk in light in ways that the world thinks is uncomfortable, but you know what? In Jesus, it's so freeing and so good. So he's saying, you know what? Expose your crud. Don't live in a darkened understanding. Expose your crud. Expose the stuff that's bad. Don't keep secrets. Don't hide your sins, but rather say, you know what? I'm not perfect and I'm struggling with this. Will somebody pray for me when I'm in the middle of going through this stuff? Don't, don't be false. Don't put on a false self, but rather be authentic, friends. Don't be fake, but let people see that you are not perfect. Let people see that Jesus Christ is perfect and he wants to work and move and, and be in me. So I'm going to live in the light of Christ. I'm going to file off my calluses. You know what? Many of us just maybe need to be correctable. Own our mistakes. Own the things we've done wrong. The, maybe the way you treated somebody or the way you acted in a certain situation. Just own your mistakes. Own your mistakes. Live in the light, friends. Be vulnerable to others with your thoughts, with your actions, with your feelings. Let the family of God love you. Choose to be loved, friends, in your pain, in your faults, in your brokenness, in your disillusions, even in your flaws. Let other people love you and care for you. 
Just live in the light. The light's so much better than living in a darkened, understanding place. See, Paul wants us to see that we have the potential to rise above our apathy, rise above our sins, rise above our hearts, hearts towards God. You have the ability to do it, friends, because the light of Christ lives in you. Verse 20, let's just read that again. That is not the way you learned in Christ. You don't have to be that way. You can be different because you've been given a new heart. You've been given a new spirit. The spirit of God will help you in everything. There's a new way and a new potential for all of us to be unified because of our identity, our destiny, our purpose in him. Walking in the light has the power to change everyone and to change everything. And when you walk in the light, you begin to think differently, friends. When you walk in the light of God, you will walk in a new way to think about life. For no, so no longer do we just live in the light to bring unity, but friends, we begin to live with new thoughts. And when we begin to live with new thoughts, we begin to live in unity in a whole new, fresh way. We need to begin to live with a renewed thought process. With a renewed thought process. If the Holy Spirit is the one that we put in the center, we're taking ourselves out of the center and put the Holy Spirit in the center, we should be asking what he thinks. Did you know that? We should be asking the Holy Spirit, what? You're in the middle. What are you thinking? You know, you're with me all the time. What are you thinking? What are you thinking about life right now? What are you thinking about this situation I've got going on at work? What are you thinking about the relationship that I have with my kids? What are you thinking about that relationship that's bad that I have with my neighbor or with my coworker? What are you thinking about me? What are you thinking about the situation that I'm in, the group that I'm in, the church that I'm in? Holy Spirit, what do you think about my city? Holy Spirit, help me understand how you think. Holy Spirit, help me understand how you're thinking about everything that I'm going through. I mean, he is our partner. He's our partner in all of life, the Holy Spirit is, and he's our center. And if that's true, he helps us stay soft. He helps us stay soft-hearted like Father God is towards us and everything. He helps us to stay soft-hearted and not apathetic in everything because we trust him. We say, help me. Help me in this situation. Help me think through this thing. See, if the Holy Spirit is in the center, he has the power to transform your mind, to transform your thought processes. See, we don't have to stay in the same place and in the same patterns and in the same ideas all the time because Holy Spirit has the power to transform the way that you think, the way that you interact. And that, again, begins to transform even your actions when you begin to think differently about who you are and who Christ is in you. And when we begin to feel ourselves getting a little hard towards somebody or towards a situation, when we begin to feel that callous form, we can say, hey, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come and help me. Holy Spirit, come and, and help me in this situation because I know you've got different thoughts than I do. You've got different, different ideas than I do. Will you help me out on this? Will you help me get creative? Will you help me think through this differently? The new self thinks this way, friends. The new self thinks, I am the image bearer of God. Genesis tells us, let's make man in our own image and our own likeness. To cover the earth in God's glory, he wanted to show the world what it looked like for him to love, right? And, and the new mind begins to think, oh my gosh, I, you know what? I was created to be like God. I was created to be a loving father. I was created to be a loving daughter. I was created to reveal Jesus to the world. Not to reveal me to the world, for I've died to my old life. I've been risen up with Christ, and now Christ lives in me. And so I am created to image bear Christ to the world, for I am Christ-like. I am a child of the light, and I'm no longer a child of the darkness. I'm a child of unity, not a child of disunity. I'm a child who is full of God's righteousness within me. I am right with God and in right relationship with him, and I can have right relationship with mankind. And you know what? Beyond all of that, I am holy because God is holy, and God's holiness lives in me. And so I'm so different than I ever was before. You see the thought pattern beginning to change, even as I speak out these identity words. Verse 23. Be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Put on this new self, this new identity, this new destiny, this new purpose, this new way of thinking. Created, how you created it? In the likeness of God. You have true righteousness. You have true holiness. Friends, before my marriage, I was super cynical, like I said. And I had to regularly renew my mind to the idea 
that childlike is better than calluses. A childlike heart, a childlike spirit, so much better than being hard towards everything. Before my marriage, I, I didn't really trust anyone. I didn't let anybody close to me. And I needed to let my wife, Corey, love me. I needed to let her into my inner circle. I had to choose it. I had to choose to have a relationship and to let her love me. And so do all of us who come into a relationship with Jesus. We have to choose to let him be the one who files down our calluses so we can feel the strings. You know what? Now in our relationship, Corey and I try and live with no secrets. We try to, to be the best of friends. We try to trust each other with everything, with every hard conversation. We have a new thought life about the way that love should work in our marriage. And the same thing can be true of us who follow hard after Jesus. For the Christian, communion becomes our renewed thinking in our new relationship. For the Christian, communion, the remembrance of the cross of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, and especially his resurrection, becomes our renewed thinking in the body of Christ. Communion is us taking the action step, saying, I'm going to trust you, Jesus. I'm going to eat that, that cracker and drink that juice, and I'm going to trust you. That if you conquered sin and death, that I can trust you with every aspect of my life. I can let you love me. See, communion and the remembrance of Jesus' sacrifice is us taking action to soften our hearts towards what's most important. To soften our hearts towards loving God and loving others. Communion releases a new thought process for the believers. When we come back to this is the most important thing. What Jesus Christ has done for us. What he's doing in us. And what he wants to do through us as believers in the body of Jesus. Imagine, friends, if we all kept coming back to the cross. Coming back to the resurrection. Come back to the gospel story on a regular basis. No matter the week we had, <laughs> no matter the week we had, whether you had a great week and everything went exactly as you had planned, or you had a terrible week and it seemed like every time you turned around, something else was falling apart. Whether you worked all week long and have a good job that you love or that you're unemployed or you have a job that you hate, no matter what, if you kept coming back to the gospel message, to the cross of Jesus Christ, whether you were busy all week long and, and every time you turned, you always had something or someone to hang out with. Or whether you were lonely and isolated and disappointed all week long, it doesn't matter. We all keep coming back to the gospel story, to the cross of Jesus Christ, to his death, his burial and resurrection. And imagine what it would look like if we would renew our thought process to him alone. No matter what kind of life that you lead or whatever is going on in your world, if we all keep coming back to the same thing, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that Jesus Christ came as a man and died for us, that Jesus Christ went to the grave and conquered sin and death, that Jesus Christ rose from the grave so that we could be free and have everlasting life both in this life and in the next. And we can keep coming back to that over and over and over again. Imagine how unified we become because we know what Jesus Christ has done for us has created us in true righteousness and holiness, like God, full of light, and that that would be the thing that would take the calluses off our hearts and soften us and make us amazing people. We always keep coming back to the cross and we always keep coming back to the gospel how unified will we become? Will we wander back into our futility of thinking, our darkened understandings? Will, will we wander back over into our old self, into our old desires and our old things? Or will we wander towards the foot of Jesus and say, this is the most important things? Friends, we're going to take communion together. Here in the room, we're going to have stations set up on, on both sides of the stage, and we're going to worship together. If you're at home, I encourage you to grab a cracker and some juice or donut and coffee, just something to represent Jesus' body and Jesus' broken, Jesus broken body and Jesus' shed blood for you and for me. I've got this little, you know, handy can, dandy, like, you know, package here that we're going to use in the room. But, but what we're going to do is say, okay, despite whatever's going on in my life, it's about whatever I'm hardened to, despite whatever I've been apathetic towards, despite whatever I, I feel like I'm frustrated by, despite whatever my week looked like, in this moment, I'm going to feel the music. I'm going to feel the strings. In this moment, I'm going to say, I'm going to just go, okay, Holy Spirit, help me think like you. Holy Spirit, soften my heart. Holy Spirit, bring me into relationship. I think some of you in this room, maybe even some of you watching online are going to say, you know what? I've never been given a new heart and today's the day. In this moment of taking communion, 
this moment of prayer, I'm going to walk into the heart of flesh instead of the heart of stone. And I think some of us that have maybe pushed aside caring, pushed aside openness, pushed aside the light, because it's just easier to be hardened towards everything, we're going to walk in freedom today and going to go, okay, it's time for me to change the way I think this morning. Let me pray, and then I'm going to take communion and take it with you online, and then you guys in the room, you can come up as we worship and, and get your elements. Father, I just, I know how amazing you are. And God, I hope this message makes sense, that you know what? We always have the potential to walk backwards, don't we? Towards a hard heart, towards calluses, even towards sin. But you're always there with arms open wide, saying, you know what? I did it all at the cross. I accomplished everything that needed to be accomplished at the cross, and I'm, I'm ready to receive you again. I'm ready to soften your heart again. God, thank you that your heart is always soft towards us, that you're never apathetic towards us. And thank you, Jesus, that you gave us communion to remember how much you love us, to remember how much you gave for us, to remember how much hope there is in following hard after you. So I pray, Holy Spirit, that in this, this moment, both those watching online and those here in the room, that in this moment of worship, we just all come back to the center. We all come back to the truth of the gospel. And in this moment, we would be unified, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you're watching at home, would you take communion with me now? Remember the cross. The rest of us, let's worship. And take communion as we worship. We'll see you guys next week. Perfection could never earn it You give what we don't deserve And you take the broken things And raise them to In the head.